So my first question, Tanya, is what does ambition mean to you? A clarity of something that you desire, yearn for, or are compelled to do. And so within that, it's a goal or a vision, just something that you're striving for, but it's usually underpinned by the desire to make change, whether that be in life, work, or for the good of others. And so within that wraps in ambition. Ambition is the driver that pushes those things forward. So under that definition, do you see yourself as ambitious? Absolutely. I think that when I do have a clear vision of what I'm trying to achieve, often it's from a cold start. And so you've got to have a little bit of tenacity and drive in there. Often you're being ambitious because it's something new or you're trying to do more. And I don't know if you would see it as ambitious when you're in it. I don't think it's a word that I've attached to myself ever. I see it in others as the compulsion and driver to do more and have surrounded myself with lots of those people and probably didn't identify in that. But if I think about the way that I've explained it, then yes, I do carry ambition and a lot of the things that I do. So there's something about that word that's not the first kind of word you would use as a label? No, I think that it's something that I've always given to others and not even a word that I've probably used or expressed. It's just an act or something that I see. Because I love celebrating achievement or journey, I kind of understand that some of these people have drive and ambition within them. And so because I'm often on the sidelines or have been for a long time celebrating others, I probably hadn't realised that I too carried ambition in much of the things that I was choosing to do as well. So it's usually a label that I would give to others. But like I said, it's not something that I've, probably a word that I've used a lot, but it's more of a sense of being and that that's a part of it. Why do you think you're this way? Why do you think it's easy for you to give that? label to someone else and relatively less easy to hold it for yourself is it something about the label itself is it something about who you are as a person it's probably the negative response to humbleness that gets encouraged and that it's often other people pointing to your success if you are promoting the fact that you're ambitious often they might be perceived in some parts of society if I think about having grown up in Aotearoa New Zealand a boastfulness in truly expressing your ambition. I don't think I've had people stifle it. I have just not proclaimed a lot of this. I've just quietly got on with it. Ambition has probably been held as an internal driver, but not something that I would talk about a lot. And so that humbleness is probably the reason why I haven't sort of thought about it a lot. But then my love of seeing other people on the journeys no matter what they are and seeing them achieve them even then I don't know if ambition is something that has woven into that it's more about the journey ambition and like I said earlier drive as a part of it and I just don't know if it's a word that we've given ourselves permission to own here to say this is what I want to do and I'm going to do all that I can to get there I'm not sure that we do that As a wider society, there's certainly elements of it in lots of sectors where there are individuals or maybe high-performance sectors. I just don't know if ambition is something that we boldly own here. And I hadn't really thought about that before until this piece of work that you'd created came about. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we're very comfortable celebrating our high achievers. Yeah. We love doing that. I mean, it's almost as if when someone in New Zealand achieves in whatever field it is you know whether it's Lord or whether it's a sports person or whether it's someone achieving a business there's this they are one of ours we will claim kinship with someone who's done something amazing but before that there's just something a little bit kind of yeah squeamy and awkward about it eh yeah so over the last nine or ten years I have been 
surrounded by a lot of New Zealand's high performance or the determines or the big thinkers or the big dreamers. And so have got to see ambition in lots of its different guises. But actually, because I care about people, community and humanity, I think I'm going through my own personal reflection about what is ambition. And sometimes ambition is just to survive the day. Ambition doesn't necessarily come with all these bells and whistles of accolade and success. You can just have that ambition to face the world. And so how expansive is the meaning of ambition? Does it sit at the top of the pile of achievement and attainment? Or is it purely in its beautiful sense to have the drive to do good in your community, not just in the world? I've been able to celebrate contributions, success, outcomes across much of our nation, from community right through to business to sport and governance and all of those things and what good can look like. And that kind of reminds me that actually sometimes you could just be ambitious and making a positive change in the community that you live in, not taking on the world to be the best in the world. That, that makes me think of something that struck me right in the early days of the project. I was reflecting on how, for me, ambition had not so much ebbed and flowed, but I had pointed it at really different things at different points in my life. And I was thinking when my kids were really little, sometimes literally ambition was to have a shower that day. Yeah. <laughs> and that was actually a really big stretch goal sometimes. And yet at other times it was, you know, I want to, you know, make this change in public policy or, you know, so the guy who wrote the book that I first read about this, Gilbert Brown, talked about reaching for just manageable difficulty. Someone else paraphrased it as within your reach, but beyond your grasp, you know, you couldn't just reach out and touch it. That could be applied to anything, you know, because it's the stretch, it's the reach that makes something ambitious. Like even in your household, you know, let alone your community or your whānau or those smaller units, or, you know, something you take in much bigger terms to the wider world, it gets really variable depending on your age and stage and where you're at, I think. Yeah, I like that. And maybe um, we haven't seen ambition as a word come into our everyday narrative because it has been reserved for quite high performance where we all know that modern life has many demands. Nasha said sometimes just making it through the day is an achievement in itself and has taken a lot of drive and determination. And there has to have been some kind of ambition in there to get through. Yeah, I spoke to several people in the course of this project who were dealing with really serious challenges, things like, you know, homelessness or recovering from addiction or experiencing family violence and truly difficult circumstances. It was really striking how that desire to do better and to reach forward was present, you know, even in their really tough times. It has been so nourishing, actually, to see people from all around Aotearoa describing ambition in these extremely variable terms, from, you know, interviewing Helen Clark and her role as a leader to someone who I rolled my window down when we were driving from Picton to Christchurch, who had come out of retirement to run the stop-go signs. She was an office worker, and she's just like, I want my community to be open. We just did an interview on the side of the road. And I mean, this woman was hugely ambitious for you know, her community, for her whānau. It was really inspiring. And I think yeah. You know, yeah. having those stories celebrated is something that's worth doing. If I were to change gears a little and ask you who is the most ambitious person you know, and that doesn't have to be an individual, it could be a bunch of characteristics, what pops into your head when I say that? I feel a lot of people's ambitions are a bit stifled at the moment. A lot of people are in survival mode and I know that ambition sits within that, but I'm just not convinced a lot of people around me are dreaming at the moment. So that's probably some of my hesitancy to really answer this. Um, But someone who's really inspiring me at the moment, I've had the privilege of joining a New Zealand charity in some of their work, Inspiring Stories, and our fierce leader, Guy Ryan, has tenacity for 10 years to take an idea 
to create a thing to build it into the structure of a charity that delivers amazing work for youth of Aotearoa and for the nation. His goals and his dream and his vision are grand. And so he's probably one of the most ambitious people I've got around me at the moment. But actually underneath him is all of the rangatahi that I've been meeting through this work. And there's just so many individuals out there with fire in their belly who are really clear on what it is they want to put into the world. And actually they're not going to wait for permission and they're not going to wait for getting older. They're going to be the change. And they're the ones that are really inspiring me at the moment and who I'm seeing. It's rangatahi with fire in their belly to be the change. And I'm getting to know more and more of them as time goes by. And it's not that they are new to this world. They've always been there. It's just a new part of our community that I'm connecting with and becoming aware of. And I suppose one of the reasons it drew me to this particular piece of work was how do I support them enabling the pathway towards their ambition and change and the things that they want to contribute So is there anything that would enable you to be more ambitious? Like everybody, um, our lives have been affected by COVID. And March 2020, I was on a round-the-world trip um, for my life in the UK, and part of that trip was a trip home. During the two weeks that we were here, the borders closed, and it became a little bit more difficult to get back on track with our tour, but also back to the UK, which was our present home. And at that point in my life, I had a lot of goals, a lot of them associated with my work. And I was incredibly ambitious. Every year I set some pretty big goals, but they're all very much work-centric. So over the last year and a half, we've made the decision last June to stay in Aotearoa and to unpack 15 years in the UK, which is a really big decision. Despite this being a home of mine where I grew up, I haven't lived here since 2005. I've actually been grappling with what are my ambitions, what are my goals, what does my next life look like here, because it's not just as simple as bringing the blueprint of my UK life into Aotearoa and living that out, of actually having to rebuild it. So I've been grappling a little bit with, am I not being ambitious enough? And is that okay? Is survival and stability enough? And once I feel stable, then can I start dreaming again? I actually need to feel a little bit more stable in my life before I can build my next vision and dream. But actually in creating this new life there's probably ambition that sits within the pillars of where we live how we work how we contribute to community but I'm starting all over again and so it just feels like I don't have the normal answers to that question I'm in a bit of a rebuild phase that's a bit scary but it's also exciting and then there's the externalness of because people have um, maybe observed my last 10 years of work a lot of people won't have known me pre that thanks to social media and things like that so people will have this perception of what I should do next and so actually I've been having to almost push that away because I know that as scary as it's been to start over it's also a privilege and so within that I can design some new dreams but I don't quite know what those look like yet so current purpose I'm fulfilling those but I know that it's an evolving thing so if you were to ask me in a year's time the same question I suspect I'll be feeling a lot clearer in it but I just need a little bit of stability and I'm building to create that and also being okay with not having a big goal right at the moment beyond that because actually stability feels like a big thing anyway And being okay to tell people that I'm not trying to change the world at the moment. I'm just trying to be good in my community. And that's that coming back to that earlier, that grappling with what is ambition and does it have many levels or has it just been a good person in your community being your current view, being more than enough 
because we've all been through a lot. So because I haven't landed on the next big thing, I have to give myself permission with the fact that that's okay. So I suppose I've circled myself around to say that ambition kind of exists everywhere, doesn't it? But I'm not feeling ambitious. I keep thinking of, again, that Gilbert Brim guy wrote about, he wrote about ambition as being relative to circumstance. And he talked about going to what at the time was Calcutta and seeing people rummaging through rubbish bins for food. And that their ambition was to feed themselves for the day. And that that was the same level of stretch required. And some of the more traditional ambition things. It absolutely resonates with me that after moving with no notice and going through the shock that that entails, that you know, rebuilding and finding a foundation would be absolutely a stretch ambition. But we moved from London to New York in 2004, and I was at the time pregnant with my third child. I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and we were in New Zealand. Um, we'd come back for my daughter's, you know, naming ceremony, and my husband got a call saying, can you be in New York for an interview on Friday? And he's like, well, I've just flown to New Zealand. They're like, all right, next week's fine. <laughs> and it was a similar sort of time scale to you. It was within no time at all. He was in New York and I was in London trying to wrap up a life. And that stuff is difficult, especially when we're used to having control, aren't we? We're used to setting goals and being in charge of stuff. As adults, we think oh, I can do this largely on my own terms. But when something like a us were part of those once in a lifetime job opportunity comes up or a pandemic comes up and suddenly those choices just tilt on their axis the way we approach the world in response to that is going to be really different to how we would in normal times it seems to me yeah the reflections on you know because I do care deeply about people and it's almost felt a bit glib to carry my own uncertainties or even unhappiness. I've been incredibly homesick for the UK, but I, my rationale, my rational mind reminds me that if I was in the UK, I'd be homesick for Aotearoa. So, you know, you just have to move through those. But everywhere I look, there are people who just don't have the same choices and privilege that I have. And so that can be incredibly humbling. But at the same time, I'm the only one that can live my existence. And in order to be any good to myself, to my family, to my community and to the subjects in the world that matter to me, I have to be stable and strong. I used to do a lot for a lot of people and at the moment I'm doing a little bit for a few and that's quite a change in gear and with that sometimes comes the feeling of am I not doing enough and then a lot of self-coaching and reaching out to wise people who can kind of help me self-reflect. So it's great. It's lovely to have that reminder that it's your circumstance. And it's really hard to present this to people who, from the outside, you know, we have much. We have so much. But from the inside, you know, because people just will quite easily say to me, it's so great to see you looking settled and happy. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm happy, but what does settled mean? And actually, you know, it's a deeper thing inside. And the life that I wake up to every day now is starkly different to the life I woke up to a year and a bit ago. And I didn't have a lot of choice in that, but I had some privilege of some choices. So it's a constant grapple, Julie, around around that. So since making the decision, we've had to do things and we do have a roof over our heads and we're employed and we feel incredibly grateful. We celebrate those. I am utilizing much gratitude and mindfulness in my life but there are days where you just think well what just happened my ambition is always driven in giving and creating for others it doesn't really sit personally within me because I attain riches through that either through experiences or some remuneration so I can have a roof over my head I'm not personally driven at this point in my life around attainment for self and so that's probably been the hardest thing is I don't feel I'm contributing as much to a community as I had been doing in the UK for the New Zealand community away. So it's a, a really, it's all ironic, right? I'm back in New Zealand now. I could be helping New Zealand, but I haven't kind of found my way. So 
yeah, it's nice to thank you for that reflection and reminder that um, our ambition is always a stretch, but it can be a reflection in a current situation. Even in a country that you're familiar with, if you switch jobs, just think of how tired you are working in a different place where you have to be conscious of your way of getting into work and where the bathroom is and where you're going to go get your lunch and who you need to ask about, you know, simple things on the job. The exhaustion that comes from having to be, yeah, just sort of aware and thinking about things that become second nature when you've been somewhere for a while. Yeah. So it's like all the energy that you don't have to direct to others. I would guess that some of that is because things that were happening in the background on autopilot somewhere where you've been a long time and we're settled that's kind of come to the forefront you know you just need to be really aware and conscious and practical stuff like you know where do you get your groceries and where do you fill up your car and yeah all that sort of stuff it sounds so silly but when you're piecing a life back together that's the reality of it the home moves on when you're away from it you come back to a different place and you have to find your place in what is your home and that takes energy and attention and time you would think I'm just going to slot back in it's not like that I don't think I'm in quarantine as I talk to you and everyone I speak to is like oh once you're back in New Zealand you know you'll realize that it's different here it's almost like COVID doesn't exist so we come out into this kind of sunshine after being in shadow for a year and a half but the shadow of COVID is still there We've seen other countries that thought they had it completely under control, experiencing outbreaks. We don't have everyone vaccinated yet. What is the COVID trauma to a person who comes back to New Zealand? The phrase that came to my mind as I was listening to you was shell shock, that everyone's a little bit frozen in place. Yeah, so we were incredibly fortunate in that we left the UK on the 23rd of February. We'd been watching... COVID since December and actually sat down my husband and I discussed where we're going to travel because we'd been watching the path of COVID and at that point in time the numbers and the nations we were traveling through were either zero or very little and it seemed to be under control. We made the decisions to set off and so from our first travel we we're making I suppose personal safety decisions that were protecting us but also those around us because we were choosing to travel and so we traveled through the UK, Kuala Lumpur, Australia, Samoa, back to Australia, back into New Zealand. By the time we got into Aotearoa, New Zealand, obviously things were kicking off around the world and whilst here the WHO announced pandemic and the world changed for everybody and since then because of the fortune of having quite an international community of friends and work colleagues. COVID hasn't personally touched us. It's changed our lives. World safety decisions and border closures made a return to the life that we knew a little bit more difficult. And then we made personal decisions to stay put. So, you know, it was not COVID as the illness, but we've had firsthand examples of, unfortunately, of friends getting incredibly sick and their lives have been changed forever We've got friends still living in isolation all around the world. We've got friends' businesses that have been impacted offshore and some here. And then equally so, we've got people thriving. And so COVID is an everyday reality for us, even though we've been fortunate to dodge the illness itself. What I see around me is, you know, we've lived through summer and all of these things and have been to major events and had mass gatherings with family and been able to go on with life is normal and that comes with a bit sense of privilege to do good with it. I've just felt that a lot of people around me have been happy with life as normal and there's nothing wrong with that but me and myself feel that we have this responsibility here to do more because we are safe. We're not living with the virus day to day despite border closures. There's a physical reality that we're not battling it as many other nations still are. So with that comes this moment in time where we are allowed to be a bit more ambitious for ourselves, but also for others. I suppose I've felt a bit disappointed in not seeing us do more for the world, but what I can't help you with is what I see that to be. And so I understand 
where people have just fought for their own existence because it has been a scary time and a changing time. And there are people here that have lost much and there are others who have done well. But just getting by is not enough. And so what could we be doing to be putting more out into the world? And what I'd like to see more of is just a little bit more of empathetic understanding of the realities being lived outside of our shores. That doesn't need to mean that we need to completely wallow in it because that doesn't help anybody, but we need to be aware of what's going on and what our neighbours or friends have been friends for many years are living through and have some empathy there. And the difficulty with living through history is that it's not too look back that you can see what you could have done differently. It's really interesting because one thing that struck me watching from the US was that so many countries were clawing over one another at a point to get the vaccines first. And the thing that I was both really proud of and also a little bit scared by was New Zealand saying, we don't need to shove to the front of this queue because we've got this for the moment. So we're not going to be demanding. But for me, watching our COVID has just gone from zero to 60 in so many places. The generosity of that decision is actually bigger than you think it is. You don't think you're giving up much because you think you've got this under control. You know, if you talk to people in India in March, they thought they had this under control as well. Even though it might not have been necessarily as intentional as it could have been. That was just an example of a country leading with its values. I just felt really, really proud to be a Kiwi. I just want to acknowledge all of those who have really stepped up and out into their local communities and helped each other and I feel that in some instances we were losing our way with that that's not to say that people have been doing nothing but I think there's a global opportunity here for us to be seen and leading the way in in many amazing things some people have stepped up and out into the community in a huge way and hopefully communities are better for it in the long run